Sarah Napton, science editor. Droughts could be consigned to history after scientists invented a water harvester that can pull moisture out of the air using only the power of the sun. The prototype, designed by scientists at MIT and the University of California, works even in desert conditions and could eventually provide households with all the drinkable water they need simply by extracting dampness from the surrounding atmosphere. The solar-powered harvester can provide three liters of water from air over a 12-hour period in conditions as dry as the Mojave Desert. CNET by SciTech Lisa Brackman. This solar pad device harvests water from dry air. This tiny box produces fresh water using only sunlight for power. Could it help solve our global water crisis? Fortune Tech David Morris. New device pulls drinking water from the air using only solar energy. A new device developed by researchers at UC Berkeley and MIT promises to bring clean drinking water to remote areas by drawing it directly from the air. Though the device is currently only a prototype, its early results appear extremely promising. Forbes, this device can pull three liters of water out of thin air. If it can be commercialized, the technology could be a boon to people living in arid regions or places where there is extreme drought. Other water harvesting devices require high humidity like fog or need electricity to power condensers. This one will work off grid and in very dry conditions according to its creators. Wow, published in one of the world's top scientific journals. It was conducted by MIT, the top university in the world, and by Berkeley, the fourth top university in the world. It was peer reviewed and it was everywhere. It got retweeted by Bill Gates. And yes, it's complete bullshit. Now, normally peer reviewed by MIT collaborating with Berkeley would usually be a fairly good barometer of quality. But in this case, the quality is just laughable to the point where five minutes on Wiki or the most superficial inspection of any of the details would tell you that these claims are bullshit. And yeah, that was way too much to ask from anyone who calls themselves a scientific journalist who covered this. With the Wall Street Journal having some of the most comically inept reporting of anyone who has ever called themselves a science reporter. Hell, your suspicions might first have been raised when they say that it can generate liters of water per day, when it actually looks like it's only generated a few drops of water. And if you look at the original paper, it looks like it runs for hours a milliliter postage stamp sized area, uh, kind of wet. And also other little peculiarities. And bear in mind, this is reading directly from the paper. The device is capable of harvesting 2.8 liters of water per kilogram of metal oxide framework daily at relative humidities as low as 20% and requires no additional input of energy. Well, if that's true, then why do you need those rather heavy duty looking wires and a giant heat sink? But it's MIT, and Bill Gates retweeted it, so it can't be bullshit, right? Well, let's start with a real killer for all of this water from air crap. And it comes up again and again and again. And it's conservation of energy. There are no free lunches. None. There are no shortcuts in thermodynamics. If so if you want to say change the height of an object, there is an absolute defined amount of energy you have to put into the system to do that. And it's the same with water. If you want to pull a water molecule off a drop of water, you have to break the hydrogen bonds. And that takes energy. There are no free lunches. And if you want to reverse that and get the water molecule to condense back onto the water, you have to get rid of the same amount of energy again. And yeah, if your water's already at room temperature, it's not going to condense unless you take energy out of the system. And that requires work. There are no free lunches in thermodynamics. So the thing that should ring the alarm bells first is if this requires the input of no additional energy 
as is clearly claimed by their paper, why does it need those big, heavy-duty looking wires going into what looks like a Peltier device? The sort of thing that's used in your typical dehumidifier. In fact, I do have to wonder, do they have the exact same Pulte devices that I have? So these are the cheap, generic 50-watt uh, Pulte devices you get from China. And there they are, you know, red on one side, black on the other. And that's it mounted up on a heat sink. So these things are four centimeters. Well, they give us dimensions on their figure. Let's see how big theirs is. Well, they say that the outer dimensions are seven centimeters. So you can measure it up for yourself. That inner Peltier device there is four centimeters. They very likely have exactly the same Peltier device as I do. So the Peltier device is you pass electricity through it and one side gets hot and one side gets cold. So the way it's typically done is you have a big ass heat sink on the hot side and a little heat sink on the cold side. Peltier device is, of course, in the middle there somewhere. Now, if I take a look at this on the infrared camera. Okay, so at the beginning here, I've set the temperature range from about three degrees to 40 degrees. Uh, so at this temperature range, everything looks fairly flat uh, for the heat sink and the background. And you'll see why I've chosen that heat range shortly. So also you'll see that the metal here is very shiny uh, in the infrared. It, you don't get the true temperature of the metal, it just looks like a mirror in the infrared. So I stuck this piece of tape um, on the heat sink and that will reflect the true temperature of the heat sink. So as I turn it on, instantly you'll see the, the tape here starts to heat up as the, the big heat sink starts to heat up and the little heat sink starts to cool down. So instantly it's gone from about 20 degrees to about 10, eight, seven, and this guy is getting really toasty now. He's up at 30 degrees, 35, 36. So the big heat sink is really pumping out the heat and the little heat sink is now getting down to almost freezing type temperatures. If you can't get this heat away, then you can't actually make this thing any cooler, right? So it's, it's really important that you have this big heat sink to actually get rid of all the heat from the Peltier device. That giant thing there with the heat pipes on is just that. So that the other side can get cool. And that's exactly how Peltier effect dehumidifiers work. Also called thermoelectric dehumidifiers. So if it runs off the power of the sun, why does it look like a conventional Peltier effect dehumidifier? Okay, so they have to pass a little electricity through their Peltier effect device, you know, essentially a regular dehumidifier, to get their free water from the air. But it can't take that much energy to get water from air, can it? Um, well, no. Look, kettles are high energy appliances. You really have to gurgle the energy into those for minutes just to boil off a tiny fraction of the water. This is you putting the energy into the system to break the hydrogen bonds. And that takes a crazy amount of energy for water. Two million joules per kilogram of water. That's about a liter's worth. So that there is one liter of water. And a little perspective, if I were to get a kilogram of silver. And that there is one kilogram of silver. And put two million joules into it. So it takes about 200 joules of energy to heat up one kilogram of silver by one degree, which means that for two million joules, you could heat this silver up, this one kilogram of silver, by about 10,000 degrees Celsius. That's hotter than the temperature of the surface of the sun. The point is that actually boiling water takes a colossal amount of energy. And the same goes for condensing water. You have to get rid of a crazy amount of energy to do it. And cooling things down takes energy. Indeed, the only place this sort of thing happens regularly on a large scale is in the atmosphere. Because the energy flux in the atmosphere is just on a completely different level. Look, the Tsar bomb was the biggest nuke ever detonated. It was 50 million tons of TNT, which seems like a lot. 
until you compare it to the amount of energy that the Earth gets from the sun. And it turns out that 50 million tons of TNT, if that were all converted into light, is merely the energy that the sun delivers to the Earth for about two seconds. Solar cross-section energies are just off the chart compared to human energy production. So when you look up and see those cute fluffy clouds or the rain falling from the sky, those are the products of a heat engine that are just off the scale compared to what mankind could ever make. Which is kind of what this project is proposing, that we actually try and do that ourselves with a heat engine. Look, whenever anyone says they want to get water out of the air, the bare minimum energy that you have to dissipate is that of forming all of the hydrogen bonds. And this is a state function. It doesn't matter how it's done. It only depends on the difference between the water being in the gas phase and in the liquid state. In the gas phase, where there are no hydrogen bonds, and the liquid state, where there are lots of them. Now, previously, people have just used Peltier-type devices, um, solid-state devices where you pass current through them, and one side gets hot, one side gets cold, and they've used those to condense water. And that's fine. That's how thermoelectric dehumidifiers work. And sure, you get water out of it. But let's take a realistic scenario for one of these dehumidifiers working under favorable realistic conditions. That's high temperature and high humidity. And it says that you get about half a liter per day out of this thing, or a liter or so every two days. And it runs at 72 watts. So if you do it for an hour, that's 72 watts for an hour. It's 72 watt hours. And if you run it for two days, it's three and a half thousand watt hours so it's three and a half kilowatt hours per liter and at typical electricity costs of about 10 15 cents per kilowatt hour that sort of thing that's going to come in at about 50 cents now bear in mind that's almost as good as the peltier technology gets now it turns out treated drinkable water out of the tap which is probably going to be cleaner than this stuff that's been pulled out of the air that'll have particulates and dust and all sorts of other stuff in it costs 0.3 cents per liter. That is, this water is about 200 times more expensive than regular tap water, which might not sound so bad until you compare it to what a 200 times more expensive liter of Coke or something would cost. So a regular bottle of Coke might cost a dollar or something. And now if it's 200 times more expensive, you would be looking at paying $200 per liter of Coke. If Coke were 200 times more expensive, it would be more in the league of fine champagne. Or let's look at what you might expect in terms of efficiency. 72 watts is 72 joules per second. So times by 3,600 to get joules per hour, and it's about quarter of a million joules per hour, or 12 million joules for 48 hours. And that's the energy it requires to get one liter of water. Now, bear in mind, we only had to dissipate 2 million joules to actually condense our liter of water. So optimistically, this thing's running at about 15%. Cool. So a regular dehumidifier like this, you can run for about three hours, and you would get about 20 milliliters of water. That's about the volume of about half of a chocolate bar. Well, they say they ran their free water from air device, which is clearly a Peltier-type device, for about three hours hours. And how much water did they convince? Well, I don't know. Looks like a few drops to me. I know. Amazing. Meaning that their dehumidifier is about an order of magnitude less efficient than a regular dehumidifier. I mean, damn. Let me use their exact numbers here. So they give a sort of maximum amount of water they can get out of their desiccant. And it's about 0.2 litres per kilogram of desiccant, or 0.2 millilitres, 0.2 grams of water per gram of desiccant. And in this picture, which is shown in absolutely every mainstream report of this discovery, they claim that they use just over a gram of this desiccant, which means that gives us an amazing 0.2 three of a gram of water there, which looks about right. And now let's just say that they ran their Peltier device, which if it's anything like mine, runs at about 50 watts or any of the other generic four centimeter Peltier devices out there. And they ran that for three hours. 
That's 150 watt hours for a third of a gram of water. Or it would be 500 kilowatt hours for one liter of water, about $50 per liter. Oh, oh yeah, and an amazing condensation rate of 0.1 grams per hour, meaning they would have to run this for 10,000 hours merely to get one liter of water. That's um, <laughs> over a year. Well, that's MIT, you know, guys, the world's top university. I'm sure they're really going to crack getting water out of the air with a discovery like this. And how do they sell this device that can create one liter of water per year at a cost of about $50 per liter? You know, champagne type prices. They say that this device is capable of harvesting 2.8 liters of water per kilogram of metal oxide framework daily at relative humidities as low as 20% and requires no additional input of energy. Well, actually reality check, for three liters, it would require a little more than no additional input of energy. It would require $150 worth of electricity, and you would have to wait for three years for your actual device to make this. I mean, even if I'm generous and say that they don't run their Pulte device at full whack, but say 20% of full capacity, it's still a complete joke. It would still require $10 of electricity to make a single liter of water, and it would still require over a year to do it. Now at this point, some people will be saying ah, that this is kind of a straw man, because they say that this device can pull water out of really low humidity air, where a regular dehumidifier wouldn't work, and they're doing it using metal oxide frameworks, and that therefore this device would work even in the desert. Well, I was just coming to that. So let's start with how a dehumidifier works. If I take a sealed container and put some water in it, that water will start to evaporate until the rate that it's evaporating is equal to the rate it's condensing. And at that point, that's 100% humidity. And if the air gets hotter, more water will actually go into the air, even though it's still 100% relative humidity. Now, this can be a little confusing in that if it's 100% humidity at, say, 20 degrees and 100% at 40 degrees, it's still 100% relative humidity, even though the absolute amount of water in the air has almost doubled. So for instance, if the air is 30% humidity at 20 degrees, and I boost the temperature up to 40 degrees, but have almost the same humidity, because some more water is evaporated in that system from somewhere, even though the relative humidity is still the same, I've almost doubled the amount of water in the air. And just to be clear, if I would take a sealed system with, say, 50% humidity and heat it up to 40 degrees, the absolute amount of water in the system stays exactly the same. But as the ability of the air to carry water is almost doubled, you about halve the relative humidity. So it is actually possible for the humidity to go down and the temperature to go up and actually have more water in the air. And that's important for later. Remember that. So what a Peltier device does is it cools down one side of the thermoelectric device. And if the relative humidity at the surface there gets up to 100%, then water starts to condense. That's the dew point. And at that point, yeah, you've got to take out your 2 million joules from the system to get one liter of water. And also, you've got to cool down a heck of a lot of air to do it, which is one of the reasons why these things have such lousy efficiency. Now, if you can never get to the dew point because your thermoelectric device can't get cool enough, as would be the case if, say, you were doing this at low humidity, that's it. You've wasted all of your energy and you will condense nothing. All you've done is cool down some air on this side and heat it up on this side. And that was all because you never got cold enough to reach the dew point. Now, the genius idea in this paper is they're going to use a metal oxide framework, basically a glorified desiccant, which will bind water molecules very strongly, even at low humidity. And then they say that the sun's going to hit this desiccant and it's going to desorb the water and generate a relatively high humidity environment, which you can then use the energy hot thermoelectric device on essentially as a regular dehumidifier. And we've seen that those cost about 50 cents to get one liter 
of water. That is, even if they had a commercial Peltier dehumidifier on this, the cost of creating about one liter of water would be about the same as the cost of buying one liter of gas. Which brings me to the tiny little problem with this genius idea from the world's top university. One that's never been thought or published before, let alone in the world's top science journals. And that's that desiccant dehumidifiers have been around for decades. And periodically they managed to convince some government officials that this is a great new idea. So this comes from news reports back in 2007. For anyone who doubted you could squeeze water from the hot, humid Florida air, here's your proof. There's the water. David Murphy says his company's found a way to pull more than a thousand gallons of water from thin air. FEMA has paid one million dollars for two units. Not a giant dehumidifier like some people might think. This is a very different technology using what we call hygroscopic media. But the secret lies with lithium chloride, an extremely salty solution that draws the water molecules from the air. The military has also shown interest because the machine promises to pull moisture from even the driest desert climates like Iraq, bypassing the logistical nightmare of transporting millions of tons of fresh drinking water. Wow, water from the air, even in the desert. <laughs> but when you start to think about it a little more, it really won't help. If there's no electricity, you can't run it. And if you want to run it off diesel generators, you have to ship in almost as much diesel as you would water. I mean, in the best case scenario they're looking at about for about 40 cents per gallon and that's the best case scenario you take this out into the desert or a low humidity environment you will be doing very well to get a fraction of that which is why they never quote the cost per gallon of water that you would expect out in the desert or in a low humidity environment and of course if you're in a high humidity environment it's likely that there's lots of water around everywhere and that you would be better off using something like reverse osmosis, which will be about a factor of a thousand cheaper than this water from the air crap. So yeah, <laughs> desiccant dehumidifiers in a sort of water from air thing is not even remotely new, nor is the idea of using the sun to enhance the water yield. <laughs> That's not to say there aren't uses for dehumidifiers, especially if you want a dry atmosphere. So yeah, desiccant dehumidifiers are nothing new. Indeed, here's a review of them from a guy working from the Department of Energy and the National Renewable Energy Laboratory going back to 1993. Now they're looking at it from dehumidifying the air for a, a various reasons, not actually harvesting that water, but the principle is exactly the same. Air dehumidification can be achieved by two methods, cooling down the air below the dew point and removing moisture by condensation, or sorption by a desiccant material. Desiccants in either solid or liquid form have a natural affinity for removing moisture. And if that was too complicated for you, if you just read the wiki article on atmospheric water generation or desiccant dehumidifiers, where, according to their numbers, where you can turn about one unit volume of gasoline into five of water. Well, let's take the more favorable numbers from the commercial-based desiccant dehumidifiers. They gobble up about one kilowatt hour to make one liter of water. That's a cost of about 20 cents per liter of water, which, give or take, means that the cost of one liter of gasoline is going to be about the same as the cost of five liters of water generated by this method. Making this one of the most expensive ways on the planet to create water. I mean, look, let me replicate their amazing discovery with what I just had lying around in my place. So I've been doing some work on zinc chloride recently, and I know zinc chloride pulls water out of the air like crazy. Guys, let's, let's weigh how much zinc chloride we're actually going to put in there. We will have... Uh, 26, 27, that sort of thing. Of... Zinc chloride. So if I tear that now, I can tell you that anything this way is over 193 grams is water that's absorbed from the atmosphere. Okay. So I'm just going to leave that there. In fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get the time-lapse camera going on this one. OK, 
Okay, so here we are. Uh, oh, several hours later. And as you can see, the zinc chloride seems to pull out quite a lot of water from the air. So let's see how much water he has actually pulled out of the air before we move on to these guys. So, you'll recall that this was 193 earlier today. And now it's about 10 grams heavier. So we collect about 10 grams of water for about 25 grams of my zinc chloride, which I want to stress is just a random hydroscopic compound I happen to have on my shelf. One that I just happen to know would absorb water from the air. So it collects somewhere between a third and a half of its own weight in water. So let's compare that to their wonder desiccant in MIT's new discovery. And I'll read from MIT News. The present version can collect water up to about 25% of its own weight. That is, my random desiccant collects more water just over a few hours than their wonderful metal oxide framework desiccant. But with further tuning, they think that, that proportion could at least double. Wow, that's an amazing technology, says Yang Yang, a professor of engineering at the University of California at Los Angeles, who was not involved with the work. It will have a tremendous scientific and technical impact on renewable and sustainable resources, such as water and solar energy. I think Dr. Yang Yang needs to go into the chemistry lab more often and learn something about desiccants. Then, of course, all I need to do is put in a sealed box, much like their sealed box. Excellent. So this is the setup. And there's our <clears throat> zinc chloride, which has pulled water in from the atmosphere. As you can see, it's about 17 degrees and 38% humidity in the room. So what I'm going to do now is going to put the top on that. As you can see, the top's got a hole cut for my Peltier device, which goes that way. And that does actually fit basically perfectly with a little bit of wiggling like that. That's basically perfect. So now I'm going to put that in the sunlight and see what happens. Okay, so there's sort of sunlight on my, my desiccant, my zinc chloride solution. All that water's from the air there, bear in mind. And now uh, you can't quite see the time there. I'll tell you the time. It's almost nine o'clock in the morning um so let's see what that does to the temperature and humidity okay so it's now almost an hour later so it's merely 10 o'clock in the morning and already the mighty power of the sun has heated us up to 32 degrees but what's this the humidity is down to 31 percent well, actually, it turns out this is relative humidity. So merely jumping the temperature from, what is it, about 17 to 30 degrees, turns out almost doubles the amount of water that's actually dissolved in the air in there. And so, yeah, it's true that the relative humidity has gone down modestly by a few points, but the increase in the air's ability to carry water has almost doubled. So now I'm going to wire up my uh, cooler, my thermoelectric Peltier cooler, and the fan, which will keep the, so it'll, it'll, a load of heat comes out the top here, and you're going to take the heat away, and then the underside there is going to get cool. And we'll see if we can condense some water using just the power of the sun. So we spark up the juice and we're pulling about 12 volts and three and a half amps so that means we're pulling through about 50 watts on this guy here actually quite a lot of energy but don't worry this is all just powered by the uh the power of the sun just like in the science paper so let's see if we can zoom in on that and see if water actually condenses so this is about 20 minutes of this Peltier device being run and I've zoomed right up so you can actually see what's going on and you can just about see the drops of water 
forming on my Peltier cooler. Okay, so let's see what that looks like now, shall we? Let's just move the fun off a little and take a look at what we have. And what we have is water. Just look at all that water free from the air. I mean, all it took was free sunlight and uh, about 50 watts of power. Basically, the key point of their paper, where they say they can get free water out of the air and it requires no additional energy input, is complete bullshit. Yeah, I know. If they'd have just said, MIT creates a device for obtaining water from the air that is only 1,000 times more expensive than current methods like, say, for instance, reverse osmosis, it probably wouldn't have had the same impact in the mainstream media as it did. And I wonder if Bill Gates would have retweeted it. If I'd have created a device that also was a thousand times less efficient than what is currently available. You know, maybe something like free gasoline from the air that's only 1,000 times more expensive than regular gasoline. I mean, you know, why burn a silly 90 cent litre of gasoline when you can use my environmentally friendly gasoline that is only $900 per litre? Or let's play another game. It's called cost efficiency. Let's just say I want to get 20 tons of water to the starving people of desert land. Let's just say their magic device from MIT works exactly as specified. Their metal oxide pulls the water out of the air just like they say it does. So all I could do is pay with the commercial dehumidifier that will provide about five liters of water for the cost of about one liter of gas, which is about the energy requirement you would need to run the generators. I can give them their free water from the air and it will cost about the same as four tons of gas. Alternatively, I could get a 20 ton tanker truck full of water and drive it one and a half thousand kilometers, it's about a thousand miles, at a cost of about a hundred or so gallons or 400 liters of gas. So just driving the 20 ton tanker truck of water to them would be about 10 times cheaper than their free water from the air dealy. And that's ignoring how many tons of gas they would have to tank in to run the diesel generators for their free water from air device. Now, if you actually read the paper, they do actually make the claim that eventually they won't use a Peltier device. They'll just use a passive heat sink, which will magically collect water for them for free. Which does kind of beg the question, if it was that easy, why didn't they just do it in the first place? I mean, it sounds wonderful and easy and cheap and except there's just the slight problem that it will never work. I mean, basically what they've got here is a little toaster oven, right? They're going to claim that all the sun's going to come down and it's going to heat up their metal oxide framework, which is then going to release that water vapor into this little box. So basically all that's going to happen is the heat's going to conduct across there like a little oven and heat up their heat sink. And if it's some passive heat sink, it's going to happen very quickly. And once that heat sink's heated up, no water will condense. Like I was saying, if it was as easy as they said it is, they would have done it. That's why they went for a Pelte effect cooler. He didn't know what would stop them from claiming that they were going to do this with no additional input of energy, despite the fact that that's exactly what they did. I mean, maybe another metaphor for explaining this. Imagine that I've got an icy cold can of soft drink and I leave it in my car under the full sun. The car will very quickly turn into an oven. Now, initially, there might be a little bit of condensation on my can of soda, but very quickly, the can of soda will just heat up to the temperature of the car and no further condensation will occur. Now, you'll recall that they said that they could get about three liters of water, three kilos of water, out of a single kilo of metal oxide framework. Now, that might instantly ring alarm bells because they said earlier that a kilo of their metal oxide framework can only absorb about a third of a liter of water. So how can they get three liters out of it? So I think what they've done here is they're suggesting that they can cycle this several times per day. Quite how they expect, get a nice 
passive cold heatsink in the middle of the day? I'm not quite certain. But let's ignore that for a moment and consider the area that a, a desiccant dehumidifier plant like this would take. And we're going to take an example that we want to generate 20 tons of water per day. That's the same as driving in our single 20 ton tanker truck of water. Now they say they can get off maybe a meter squared of panel, something like half a liter of water per day. I'm just going to let them take that it's just for the sake of argument. So two square meters will get you about one liter of water per day or 2000 square meters will get you about one ton of water per day or 40,000 square meters will give you about a tanker truck full of water per day. Now, perspective time. A tennis court is about 10 meters by 20 meters or 200 square meters. So you would need an area the size of 200 tennis courts covered in panels to rival merely driving one tanker truck full of water to them per day. And if you're holding out that this is somehow going to get magically more efficient, you're wasting your time. People have been playing with dehumidifiers for this sort of thing for decades, and they're already pretty close to what's thermodynamically possible. Now there's a lesson here. <laughs> Just because someone publishes in one of the world's top science journals, published by MIT and Berkeley, the world's top and fourth top universities respectively, it doesn't mean that it's right. In fact, it doesn't mean that it's not a complete absolute bonehead maneuver based on something that's been around for decades. Sure, it's published in a top tier peer reviewed journal, and so it is more likely to be right. But these things happen. I mean, you remember things like Pons and Fleischmann where they're cold fusion. Well, had I been making videos back in the day, I would have simply told you they were talking crap because had they actually managed to get the cold fusion that they'd have claimed, they would have all died of radiation poisoning. That is, the fact that they were walking around and alive was testimony enough that they never had any large scale mega electron volt type nuclear reactions in their lab. Yet they happily claimed at the press conference, backed by their scientific credentials, that cold fusion would solve environmental problems and it would provide a limitless, inexhaustible source of clean energy using only seawater as fuel. They said their results had been confirmed dozens of times and that they had no doubt about them. In the accompanying press release, Fleischmann was quoted saying, what we have done is open the door to a new research area. Our indications are that this discovery will be relatively easy to make into a usable technology for generating heat and power, but continued work is needed. First, to understand the science, and secondly, determine the value of energy economics. And despite its obvious shortcomings, that it was obviously bullshit, that they would have been dead if their claims had been true, the university still threw money at them like candy. Millions of dollars of it. Honestly, if you have to trust someone about science, it's probably best to go with a scientist. But there is no substitute for what is hard, and that's to understand the detail. And that's something that few of us actually have the time to go through. So we have to rely on the media to do this for us in one shape or another. Sadly, modern media of all forms, both old and new media, is an attention economy, where in almost all cases, no one cares if it's true or not, as long as it gets people's attention. And in this world, it's expected, like in this case, that every single news organization just copies these bullshit claims without even checking them, because they get people's attention. Of course it would, when they claim that this device can get liters of water out of the desert air for free. Whereas in reality, their actual device would take over $100 of electricity to get just these few liters of water. And their actual device would take over three years to make those three liters of water. Or if they actually had a facility that could produce merely one tanker truck of water per day, it would be the size of 200 tennis courts. And that's according to their own very optimistic numbers. 
but maybe the most comically inept scientific reporting I've maybe ever come across comes from the Wall Street Journal here. Water, great when you have it, terrible when you don't. But what if you could suck up the water that's naturally occurring in the air? Researchers at MIT and Berkeley say they've developed a device packed with a special powder that captures water molecules floating around in the air. It's powered by sunlight, so it probably wouldn't work as well on a day like today. You mean a nice overcast day where it looks like it's about to rain. But here's how they're doing it. The researchers leave the prototype outside overnight to give the water collecting powder time to collect moisture. Yes, they went to all the trouble of creating the animation and then say that the powder is actually on the Peltier device and they even went to the trouble of drawing wires for the Peltier device. During the day, the machine then harnesses solar energy to warm up the powder enough that it releases the water as vapor. Then it liquefies and drops into a vessel. No, that's not even how it claims to work. They were able to collect about a cup of water. No, they barely collected a few drops of water, not even a milliliter, let alone a cupful. But they think the potential could be much greater. They calculated that their device could collect about three quarters of a gallon using about two pounds of the powder. So what could it be used for? It could eventually help provide water for people living in dry environments. Please kill me. Although the technology produces water that is potable, it's distilled, so it lacks the minerals that give water its normal flavor. The researchers say that dissolving a mineral powder could remedy that. Whether that'll make it taste like the water you're used to? That's another story. And that was it. That's what class is as science journalism at the Wall Street Journal. So as far as I know, I am the only one who actually looked at these numbers and said, hell no, this is bullshit on almost every level, because I am the one who checks. And yeah, if you like media like this, where the numbers are checked, you can support this channel directly through Patreon.